The changes in the education sector, the way we assess students, the rise of digitalization and artificial intelligence, the changes in the learning environment and many other unusual and controversial questions. We will be examining them one after the other in this channel. My name is Daniel Wisniewski and this is Education Chatter. Welcome to the Education Chatter. Today we have a very special guest calling us all over from Chicago, Professor Yong Zhao, who is a professor at University of Kansas and professor at University of Melbourne. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation to the Education Chatter. Thank you. Happy to be here. Professor, uh, we have we have chat before a little bit in order to kind of warm up before this recording. Uh, we agreed we're going to talk about languages and we're going to talk about languages, learning languages in the field of, uh, in the times of artificial intelligence. We want to discuss how many languages can a child actually learn, um, whether the learning of languages will change because of artificial intelligence and the use of artificial intelligence in education or the evolution of, of learning languages in general, or maybe learning languages will become obsolete because artificial intelligence will actually make it all for us. All of this today in Education Charter. So again, Professor, thanks a lot for being here with us. Thank you. I'm going to hit straight away to the point. You see, I have five children myself. Uh, my wife is Spanish. I am Polish. And so we speak our national languages to them. So they speak two languages straight away. We also live in Belgium. In Belgium, you speak, uh, well, in, depending on the part of Belgium you live, you either speak Flemish, which is a part of sort of a kind of a Dutch language, or French in the Francophone part of Belgium, or German, if it's in a German region or German speaking region. Um, but our children in school, they, they actually learn English and French. So they sort of start talking four languages. But the question is, I'm worried as a father. How many languages can a child learn simultaneously at the same time? Well, I mean, there's really no research on that. Uh, the research I've seen is from Canada in the 1970s, says that uh, uh, any child can learn up to three languages fluently without any problem. You know, you can, but it may, you know, the in the beginning, the language may we kind of get disoriented in the beginning if you have too many languages, you know, but gradually they can become better. So three languages is, as far as I know, not a problem. But of course, this all depends on the context. You know, in your family, like you described, Polish, Spanish, English, German, you probably could mingle all of them. It's not a problem. It may take them a while to sort it out, you know. But, they, you know, in most contexts, however, Learning two languages is very common if you have a bilingual immersion program. Uh, uh, so that's not a, a challenge at all. It's uh, I think there is a, a mistake in some countries that uh, they think you are learning a foreign language may decrease the time to learn your native language. I, I think that's just uh, a mistake because very often language is taught very poorly in schools. Uh, it's not really acquired easily so in your play, place i think you can probably try four languages you know so, you know there are some other polyglots people can do 40 languages you know that i think it's uh but of course that time is really the major issue and also context matters i must tell you you just calmed me down a little bit because uh, sometimes observing my children they are very small still but sometimes observing them i kind of see that they mingle languages a lot uh, they speak Polish with the Spanish phrasing or Spanish with the French phrasing and so on, an order of the words in the sentence and so on. Uh, so sometimes I'm actually quite worried about this. But I wouldn't we... worry. Code switch and code mixing is very normal, but they will gradually develop sensitivity to what word belongs to what language, you know, and what grammar structure belongs to what language. They, they will evolve. It takes a while. 
I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, one thing that is also quite quite funny in our family is that um, we actually invented our own family language, which is a mix of these four. Uh, and we ser we call certain things in Spanish, others in Polish, others in French, and others in English. Uh, and that's that's indeed is 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 quite extraordinary that each family can build its own language um, with 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 a mix of 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 these. Yeah, and another thing is, is you, you want to think about, are you just learning the language or are you learning the culture? Are you learning to read and write or are you simply learning to speak and listen? And also how deep the language is. Are you truly bilingual, trilingual? So, so your question really has a lot of different implications. I would say, you know, to be fluent in three languages should not be a problem. Correct. Now... Speaking of this, um, how does school do with teaching languages? Of course, it really depends on the jurisdiction. In some countries, you know, learning languages is, is the obvious thing to happen. I can give you an example here in Flanders, so part of Belgium. It's a natural thing to happen that people speak English. Then in the Francophone schools, it's not that obvious though. Uh, there are certain countries where, uh, uh, let's say, being multilingual is normality uh, and others that it is not at all normal at all. How do they do this? How do you think they're actually doing it in different jurisdictions? Well, from my observation is that if you think about the majority of schools in the world are not doing a good job teaching another language, you know, and, but there are some schools, like you described, I think uh, uh, Europe, uh, it's Western Europe particularly, uh, is very good uh, example of that. It's, it's not only in schools, but you have television, films, family, libraries, markets, you have a lot more other support. But in most countries, when a second language is introduced as a foreign language, it's not done very well. You know, I, I think East Asia, for example, China, Japan, Korea, they've tried very hard to introduce another language, mostly in English. And a lot, a lot of children do not really master the language. Of course, in English speaking countries like the US, Canada, uh, Australia, uh, uh, even though they try to teach foreign language, I don't think they've succeeded very well. Uh, the majority of students uh, graduate, maybe they can pass the exam, but I don't think they're fluent at anything. Uh, you know, if in the U.S. you have students, maybe take three years of French or four years of Spanish in high school, you know, they can barely go order a drink in another country. So it's uh, most of them, I would say, is failure in second language learning in terms of uh, fluency. Correct. It's like it's like I can pass the exam. So officially I can I don't know, I can have a certificate. But when it comes to going to, let's say, Madrid, because uh, I was teaching, I was learning Spanish, I cannot really order a drink, as you say, or I don't feel yeah. confident about it to do this. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. You see, some time ago um, in this on this channel, I had the pleasure to of interviewing Professor Rose Locking about artificial intelligence and uh, and the future of education. And she told me back then um, that it will be our choice to kind of decide what kind of skills we want to give away to the artificial intelligence. And therefore, it will be our choice to see what does artificial intelligence do for education and what will be what will remain the skills that we want to be taught in schools. Can language be replaced and learning languages be replaced by artificial intelligence? Again, that Daniel, that's a, a very big question, you know, because, you know, learning another language and truly learning another language actually helps you to, like, for example, people say, you know, fight uh, even dementia. If you are speaking, you know, try, bilingualism helps. It also helps you understand other people better. You know, like now you and I are talking in our second language. English is your second language or third language. English is my second language. And, but, you know, our communication is quite fluent. But not only that, we understand the culture in English. We understand different people. So, so in that sense, it's a human capacity 
that can never be replaced by artificial intelligence. However, it can be replaced if you simply want to use it as a tool, you know, that which is most schools treat that. Like if you, even today, you can live uh, in, go to another country, like uh, when you go to Spain, grab, I mean, or machine translation is very easy. And uh, a Google translation definitely beats many schools, you know, years of teaching language. And, you know, with the uh, open AI, well, now which open AI is in trouble. And, but if you think about all the new artificial intelligence tools coming out, it's even more powerful. I remember many, many, many years ago when Google Translation just got started, I was in um, Brazil, uh, which speaks Portuguese and I needed water. And uh, in, I just used Google Translation to solve my water problem with the hotel staff. That was, you know, that was like from 10, 15 years ago, many years ago. So, so if you want to simply travel to another country, you want to go shopping, you want to go order food, uh, machine translation solves that problem. And at the same time, given what we said about most schools don't teach language successfully, and I have been advised maybe if you don't teach it well, probably shouldn't teach it at all because it's, it doesn't help. It's a waste of the, your education time. But there are people who wants to become special linguists, special interpreters. They want to understand other cultures. I think you need another language, but also language is best learned through immersion. And when you are young, when you have uh, access to other materials, which is not available in most countries. So, so this is a very complex issue but I do think in the future, if you simply want something translation, it's very easily done. But if you want, you know, high quality uh, understanding of other cultures, other people, if you want truly want to appreciate the diversity of the world, I'd advise you should be speaking multiple languages. Yeah, I, I, you see, this is, um, again, I'm going to share my personal story here. Um, I think indeed that languages are kind of vessels of culture. Uh, they help us to understand each other, not, well, of course, verbally just to talk, but they, even the origins of words, they have hidden messages about our culture, about the way we think. And uh, myself, I speak four languages as well. And, and every time I'm kind of astonished by uh, the beauty of it, like the, the origins of different words coming from a certain understanding and the way of thinking behind it. Um, and so uh, I, I completely agree with you in saying that uh, it's, it's not just about you need, you know, translation when you are on vacation. That's indeed, we could use all kinds of machine translations or, or online tools for doing that. But that's that's not really establishing relations with people with from other countries. It's really about you know surviving and at the times that you need to. Like I sometimes I receive emails in languages I don't speak, and yes, I can translate them and then respond in that language using Google Translator. Of course, this is not amazing language, but uh, or level of language, but we can communicate it for business or use it for business. Another story is if we would like to build relationships with people and understanding their culture. And that's indeed means that uh, learning languages has a value in itself. It's not just about utilizing it uh, or monetizing it. It's actually, it has a value in itself. And as you said, it actually has a positive impact on our mind. There's, uh, there's also the issue of uh, language differences. You know, like uh, if the, there are shorter distances between, among some languages there are bigger differences among other languages. Like for example, you were talking about Europe. You know, Europe, European languages, you know, technically are much closer to each other than European languages to East Asian languages. So like in, in, in Europe, I don't think there are many people who speak Japanese or Chinese or Korean or Mongolian, you know, think about that. So, so there is a, so if you, if the language distance is big, being able to cross that distance makes you a lot more, a lot more fluent in your thinking. You know, you understand other cultures you know, because 
like you, you're absolutely right. Languages and uh, thoughts are always intertwined and they, they are connected. And, and But also it requires you to truly develop a deep, deep understanding of the other language and the culture behind it. Yeah, I just referring to this discussion, I, I remember I did a, another interview at this channel uh, with uh, with a professor of ancient languages, of ancient Greek and Latin. So in fact, uh, languages that are no longer spoken. And I asked her this question, why do you teach this? Why people even want to study this? And she said, there is a good in itself in it. And you do it also for the fun of doing it. And I think I really agree with her. Um, one more comment. I remember when I learned English uh, eventually to, to such a degree that I felt fluent about it. And that was in, in fact the first language I've ever learned uh, to, a, to a proficiency proficiency level that allowed me to communicate easily with people. And, and I remember that I even understood better my own language. I understood better my own village uh, because and the system of my language. And I even started to use my language better because of the understanding of the construct of 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 language so it has a value in itself as you as you say now we live in a uh, so we already kind of tackled the question whether it's obsolete or not uh, but how will the learning of languages change because of the artificial intelligence is there any you know sometimes i speak with educational experts and they tell me that the ways we teach has been changing, but they often complain saying, it's true that we kind of changed the method. So we used to use just the chalk in the past, then we used to use the whiteboards, then we used to use the, uh, the PowerPoint presentations, but the pedagogy didn't change. Um, how will the learning of and teaching of languages change? Can it change or will we stay the same? We will be all the time in the groups, we will do exercises and so on and so on. Well, it has already changed, uh, you know, if you're willing to, but not everybody is, you know, engaged in such way. For example, a few years back, people began to use, uh, you know, networks to bring in native speakers. You know, I know China, for example, founded several companies that bring Americans, Australians, or, or English to teach, to tutor children in Chinese families, which is expensive, you know, but, but, but you know, that was just one way. So you can have direct access to a native speaker at any given time if you're willing to pay the money. And that's still true, right? Right now, you and I are speaking here. We can easily connect and that's been connected but that's not happening in schools, you know, in many ways. I've also seen Australian companies um, bringing Chinese people to teach Chinese language in Australian schools via technology. So, so that, that's one thing. Another thing that I think has changed a lot is, uh, you know, uh, we, I used to help developing software to teach English and teach Mandarin Chinese to others. And there's a lot of right now access to dictionaries, isn't it? to grammar explanation easily, access to video and audio very differently. You can use that. I think right now, probably there's a lot of, lot of uh, uh, teachers use online video or audio to teach authentic you know, uh, native speakers. We also have seen other uh, companies, you know, uh, like Duolingo uh, using online teaching and infuses technology and artificial intelligence. And now with artificial intelligence, it's become, become even better. You can use artificial intelligence to teach your language, to test your language, to try oral comprehension. You can, you can interact with the machine in one language and come out in another language. So, so all of this is, is easy. And I think the challenge really comes from uh, students. Are you interested in learning? Why are you learning? Do you want to become bilingual or trilingual? I, I think, do you have the time to do that? You know, I think when you mentioned about the artificial intelligence uh, uh, specialist, uh, Professor Larkin, I think you're mentioning, that's very interesting is that your choice. Today, learning has to become personalized, which means you have to give up something in order to gain something. 
what you want to be good at, what you want do not want to be good at. You know, language learning definitely has a lot of value, but it doesn't mean you have to pursue that value. You can use the time to do something else if you can become, you know, specialist in other domains. So I think language learning pedagogy should have changed, but in most schools, I don't think they have changed, but it can be changed and should have changed. And the learner, I mean, really, like you and not, I, you know, even though we are a certain age, but we can stop and learn, spend two hours learning another language without any problem. You don't need a teacher right now. You can access all sort of materials and uh, communication partners. Remember we used to do pen pals. People write letters you know, from different countries. Now you can do email, you can do video message. You know, so it, it's, I think technology has is there, but the pedagogy may not be there. And also the students, not of them are motivated to pass a language test, not to learn the language. And so speaking of students, do you think that uh, uh, students will still want to learn English as the main lingua franca, the, the language of communication worldwide? Um, there's this entire discussion about, you know, the, uh, well, it's a kind of a Western supremacy over of, of the languages. Uh, now the rise of, of China, whereas, uh, you know, Mandarin is in fact the, the most spoken language in the world. Is it possible that Mandarin could actually replace English in any way? I know many people, and I have friends myself here in Brussels, that send their children to uh, to, to, the lake, to to the courses of Mandarin. Uh, what do you think about that? Can the main international language change? Um, I don't think so. I, I, I was very much involved in promoting Chinese. I used to run a Confucius Institute, actually, in, in the U.S. at Michigan State University. We try to promote, but I don't think the idea is that um, Mandarin is going to replace English because it's not only about the number of people who speak the language. It's also how, how business is conducted. You look at English, you know, that's a massive amount of literature in science in every domain in science in literature in you know in economy in everything is a lot of is in english and you want to have access to the past to history it's in english and also there are a lot more people conducting truly international communications using english and like you and i are using english we're not using mandarin because mandarin now is, is spoken, but you know, by 1.3 billion people, 1.4 billion people, probably more than that. But that's mostly domestic, uh, and there even, is, uh, you know, I even heard an anecdote about Mandarin that in, if you are not learning it as a child, there's no way. There will be some sounds that you will not be able to pronunciate. It's a, it's an anecdote. I have no, if this is, it has, you know, any truth in reality. But this is what I've heard. So if you're not exposed to Chinese or Mandarin in, in general, let's 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 use that word. Uh, as a child, there will be sounds in that language that a European or, or well, a European person would not be able to pronounce. I don't know what's your. I don't think that's correct. No, I, I, that's actually what we call. There's some some psychological thing we we call it critical age. That once you pass certain age. And uh, it's critical age for different things, for vocabulary, for grammar, for pronunciation, maybe like 13 or 14. It's almost for any language. You know, like a, a Mandarin speaker, for example, began to learn English when he or she is 14 or 15, he will have a carry accent. You know, it's, it's the same. It's, it's vice versa. It's the same thing. It's not just any language. Mandarin is not extremely difficult. In every language has some difficulty. It really is the difference between two languages you know if you like span from english to mandarin versus you know english to french or or, or english to german it might be different so i i don't think it, there is a, the, your your anecdote is really overstating the difficult level of mandarin is it um, yeah coming back coming back then to uh to digitalization you said schools fail in teaching languages. How could we really support one, the schools and two, the teachers? Is there any way to do that really? 
or indeed the future is we should not be really hiring those teachers in the schools to teach languages, but we should indeed give access to the native speakers and do it online. What are your thoughts? On well, that? I think again, it's it's a it, it is a very challenging question. Remember, in educational technology, even since the nineteen twenties, you know, since the film was invented, people were thinking about not having teachers. Of course, you know, that's from Thomas Edison saying we don't need books, we don't need schools, we don't need teachers. We can use film to teach everything, not only language. And it's been over a hundred years. We had a television, we had radio, we had internet, we had in the DVDs, we had all hypermedia, all kinds of things. It has not changed uh, teaching, you know, but I don't think schools can truly allow students to run their own school, even though I've, I'm, I'm actually promoting personalization of learning, let students manage their own learning, but which is very difficult. So I think teachers are needed, adults as guides, as facilitators, as resource builders, they're definitely needed. And, but at the same time, students need to pursue their own interests. Do you, I mean, this is like not, not only applies to language, it applies to math, to science, to every subject. Students can drive their learning but they need adult guidance and facilitation. I think teachers need to change, but how will they change? I don't know. I've been in education for more than 30 years. Uh, you know, some teachers change, some teachers don't. And, and also you cannot really truly require every teacher to change because when they sign on to the teaching, they did not sign on to change. They signed on to pass on the tradition. Correct, and it's like, uh... It's, it's so much true that we are kind of educating teachers to teach in a certain way and and yet education currently is exposed to such a change uh, that many of those teachers realize that, well, one, their skills are obsolete uh, and two, they sort of do not enjoy the new way of teaching as, as it could be proposed. Uh, I think that even on this channel, we had a discussion on on can artificial intelligence replace teachers? You say Thomas Edison uh, mentioning that with film, we could actually replace them. A uh, hundred years later, we, we still have them. And I think we, we see uh, the value in it. Um, interestingly enough, in that talk with, again, with Rose Lockin, uh, what, we, what we kind of concluded together was that uh, indeed we will have to decide of what kind of skills uh, we want to be taught by artificial intelligence, but there will be a humane aspect of our of our very personhood uh, that uh, will have to be there, and will will be provided by the teachers themselves. And so that is that is I think that that it would be an interesting interesting conclusion from that talk. Now well, I, I wrote a book uh, about eight nine years ago. It's called Never Send a Machine to Do a never seen a human to do a machine's job. So there was a, a, the book was really about that idea that let teachers do what human beings can do, let machines do what machines can do best. So, so a lot of times our teachers in the classroom are actually doing what machines can do. We should let that go. So the book is called Never Seen a Human to Do a Machine's Job. Yeah, and uh, so certainly we recommend that book here in the chapter. Uh, never again can you repeat the title never send a human to do a machine's job well, wonderful um, coming back and I think I will not uh, uh, I will have one more one more question about this learning language is a huge business um, you know you say that many schools do it poorly yet uh, there's a great number of students that still want to learn languages for this, for this very reason, it's like on the one hand we want to communicate when we go on, when we go on vacation, uh, but in many ways we also want to understand the culture of a particular country, where a language is a is, is a vessel of that culture, is a, a kind of an exposition of that culture, that puts it all in words. Now, do you think that this market will will somehow change? Well, there, I mean, the interest of learning languages probably will stay there, uh, but will it indeed go into this di digital dimension where we will be learning languages using Duolingo and platforms, 
or we will still continue learning in their let's call it traditional language schools, uh, however you you would envision them. Well, I think it will change definitely. It's uh, like like I was describing, for example, politics can change. You know, like I described a few years ago, it was a huge multi-million, probably a billion dollar business for Chinese companies to bring uh, uh, native speakers of English to Chinese families via technology. But the policy changed uh, um, three years ago, said you cannot run those things. So suddenly millions of people lost jobs. So, so that, that, that was big change. And another big thing is that when you learn a language, a lot of them, you know, it's not for vacation or traveling, it's to study abroad. So many people want to learn languages to go to another country. If you want to go to another country to study, technically, again, you could use translation to do the job, but I don't think many people are doing that. But let's say in 10 years, if the translation is so good, maybe an English college, English university would not require English because you can bring your artificial intelligence tools to do that. That could change, right? That, that's possible. Another thing is that I think the um, the language learning business, that technology, language learning technology, is uh, making money now. Like we talk about Duolingo and other language software, and not necessarily use human beings. So that may actually affect change. I, I think you know it with now the uh, large language models right now coming out with artificial intelligence. That is really affecting many people without acknowledging that yet. So, so, but also remember this, schools will teach foreign languages for a while. I don't think many countries are ready to abandon that. And uh, because again, learning another language, like you said, it, it, there is a lot of value in the learning process as well. You know, it's like, you understand your own language, appreciate cultural differences. There's a lot of things. So I, I think I don't think schools will change dramatically, but you know, in terms of uh, the language as a business outside schools, that may have maybe affected a lot. I say a lot of people, even when they migrate to another country, they don't learn the local language. They use technology to sh to do shopping. They find their own local communities. So it's I, I, that's not. You know, a lot more people. I, I see that happening here in Belgium a lot. You have lots oh, really? of, yeah. kind of small you don't communities. Need it, but... Yeah, you 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 form your own small community, and uh, you know, like Chinatown, Italian town, you know, you know, Polish town. You know, you do. You don't need to have a, a local language to migrate. Actually, correct. It's it's actually quite interesting because I even have friends, uh, Polish people living here in Belgium. Uh, they don't speak the language. They even purchase everything that is bigger than just grocery store and grocery shopping in Poland, and they send it. They send it via post. <laughs> to them. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Actually, I, that's that's the other side. What I call the negative side of uh, technology, because now you can watch Polish TV on your on your on your phone. Right. You can order online. You know, using Polish. Even you can order in Belgium. You know, you can translate. You can order ride using Uber. You don't. You don't need another language to survive. Simply to to work, you know, over in that place. So that's the negative side because it reduces the motivation. Digital accessibility. What you're speaking of, this digital accessibility actually creates even more bubbles in in yeah. bubbles. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. you don't really need to speak national language to work, live. And, and you can maintain your friendship that way, right? You right. you are online with your your home friend, friends. You don't need the local friends anymore. So it's uh, the host country, the home country, changing uh, actually segregation is even bigger. You know, for for some people. Interesting. That's an interesting story. I think you know that digitalization is actually threatening integration. On the one hand, is increasing yeah. polarization. I think we've seen that in the political world, and it's increasing yeah. those. Um, yeah, this 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 polarization and and bubbleization. I don't know if we can say that. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, across across countries. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Well, I think. Well, anyway, Professor Zhao, thank you very much for this. I think we came to a conclusion that learning languages is not obsolete. That the artificial intelligence will certainly not 
kick all the uh, language teachers out of their business. Uh, but I'm going to ask this to my to our viewers at Education Charter. What are your thoughts about this? Uh, do you think that artificial intelligence can actually help us with languages to such a degree that we will not need to learn them? I think together with Professor Zhao today, we, we kind of realized that there's more to it than just uh, uh, you know basic communication and that if they actually are necessary, those skills are necessary to understand people's culture. But maybe in the future, what we will be doing is we're going to be learning languages for the pleasure of doing that. And if you if you agree or disagree, comment on our channel. Uh, we, we always try to answer all the comments that we see. And yet again, uh, Professor Zhao, thank you very much for your time, for accepting the invitation to Education Charter. I think it was an inspirational talk. And let's stay in touch in the future. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and by the way, I just want to let you know, I wrote an article about how artificial intelligence might change language education. It was published in the uh, Asia Education Foundation's uh, blog website in Australia. Uh, thank you very much. What we can do, and maybe after this chat, we can also post the link to that article on the channel. So thanks a lot, Professor, and stay connected. If you like this content and you would like to get notifications about our next movies, uh, please press subscribe. Then you will be receiving all kinds of information about, about our network, about the movies we, we do, and the talks on education. Thanks a lot for today. Thank you, Professor Zhao, and let's stay in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.